Uh, thanks everyone for coming and anyone out there in Zoom land. Um, my name is Neil Duffy. I am the Sustainability and Resiliency Director for the City of Salem. Um, and we are here to talk about uh, Resilient Together the Point and provide an update on um, the preferred Palmer Cove Park flood mitigation alternative that we've developed um, as part of this project. Um, for folks who are here, uh, there is there will be some refreshments that will be here soon. Uh, so um, bear with us there. And then if you're if you are on Zoom, you um, can raise your hand or uh, submit any questions in the chat and we have uh, Christian team, our project manager monitoring that so he can let us know if there are any technical difficulties occurring. If you are listening on Zoom and need Spanish translation, you can select the globe button at the bottom of the Zoom screen and select Spanish uh, for your language. Um, so with that, we will get started. Um, as I mentioned, we're here to talk to provide an update on Resilient Together the Point. Um, before we launch into that, just to talk a little bit about our team. Um, I'm the Director of Sustainability and Resiliency. I also work very closely with Christian Team, our project manager. And uh, we also have Stacy Kilb, our outreach and engagement coordinator here tonight. And there are some other folks from the city uh, who are not here at this meeting, but are part of this project. We also have with us uh, the consultant team that we've been working with. Uh, Nasser Brahim from Woods Hole Group is uh, not here uh, for this meeting, um, but is a very important part of our team. And there may be some questions um, that are better answered by Nasser than we will, uh, we, we may have to get back to you, but otherwise um, uh, Naomi Cottrell from Crowley Cottrell is here as well as Ryan and Allison from Collins Engineering. So before we talk about um, our latest update on the flood mitigation alternative in Palmer Cove Park, just a brief recap on this project. Um, Resilient Together is Salem and Beverly's uh, combined climate action plan uh, beginning in the summer of 2020. Uh, Beverly and Salem worked together to develop a climate action plan, which was then adopted by both cities in June of 2021. Resilient Together the Point was a neighborhood specific project that emerged from that. Uh, the city of Salem decided to focus on the Point neighborhood because of both the um, physical vulnerabilities as well as the uh, social vulnerabilities here in this area. Um, and this has been a, um, now we're in our third year of this process of um, planning for uh, climate resiliency in the Point neighborhood. The initial project looked at all of the impacts of climate change. Um, what we have been focused on for the last year is really looking at coastal flooding due to sea level rise. Uh, we all uh, certainly are experiencing uh, more flooding now um, in this neighborhood and throughout Salem, and that will only continue as the years go on. Um, and one way to think about it is that a, a rare event now will be a more probable or likely event uh, going forward and then will be much more common um, in further out into the future. So that's the way we're planning and, and the resiliency that we're planning for at Palmer Cove Park is to address not just uh, the present day flooding that we're experiencing, but what we will experience in the future. Just a quick review on um, the impacts we're seeing in the near and mid and long term. So this map is an overview of uh, Palmer Cove Park and the Point area. Um, it's showing in the royal blue what a likely flood would be. So 10% chance of something like that happening every year 
Um, and then a rare flood in the, in the lighter blue is, is a 1% chance or maybe once in a hundred years, uh, you would get that much flooding. If you go out to 2050, as mentioned before, the, the more rare flood becomes likely. Um, and then the common floods actually are what we were talking about as likely in 2030. And then, um, you know, so it just, it gets worse and worse as the time goes on. Um, then if we look further out to 2070, the common flood then is um, what we were talking about as a more rare event um, now or in 2030. Um, it's important to keep in mind that these planning horizons of 2030, 2050, and 2070 are, are what are, are typically used, but that's not set in stone. And, and these are um, conservative in that we are um, estimating on the high end of what would be possible. Um, certainly uh, 2070, maybe the flooding will not be um, this prevalent, um, but this is just to give an idea of, of when we may be experiencing these things. Uh, this is just a map showing the project area. Um, what you see in yellow is the line of protection that we are studying and have been working on for the city. Um, and the idea is that um, the Shetland Park development, uh, which is currently in plans to be redeveloped, uh, they will be raising their site. So there's an opportunity here that whatever we do could be connected to that site uh, such that there would be a, a more significant line of protection for this area. Um, so it's actually uh, a good timing in that regard. Rather quickly, just um, I think it goes without saying that there are, are some incredibly valuable assets um, that this would be protecting. Uh, numerous homes and businesses, uh, many important services for the people who live here and other people in Salem and in the general area um, and uh, transportation routes. So uh, this um, project is certainly protecting much more than, than just the park that, is, that it is in front of. So people know this is, um, well, I, I, I didn't mention at the beginning, this project has been uh, funded by CZM, which is a state agency. Um, the grant that we received for this project ends um, at the end of June. Um, as part of this project, we have had multiple community meetings uh, about this, um, as well as uh, different interactions with community members um, door knocking, um, you know, meeting with people uh, and other meetings um, with the Pioneer Terrace community, um, the senior housing um, development that's in uh, Palmer Cove Park. So the, uh, what we're talking about tonight is the result of all of that community outreach. We began with speaking to community members and surveying them on uh, what their preferences would be um, for a flood barrier in this area. And the goal was to try to um, make this uh, flood barrier as much of an amenity as it possibly could be while still affording the community the protection that it needed. So we started with um, some general surveying of the community on on what their preferences were and what was important to them about being in this area, what was important to them about Palmer Cove Park and living near the water and uh, developed some alternatives, received some specific feedback on the different ideas that we presented to them. And, and now we're at the point where we are settling on uh, what we're calling the preferred alternative. And so we'll be going forward with this concept and the goal at the end of this grant um, and at the end of this, particular process is to have what we're calling a grant ready project with um, design documents that we can then uh, pursue the project for further and hopefully move it towards construction in the next 
you know, two to five years. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Naomi Cottrell to talk about the preferred option. Can we move that? Yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk us through um, the, as Neil said the preferred option. Um, this is uh, what we're calling existing conditions plan. It does actually show in this rendering the current um, park at Palmer Cove Park with its uh, the car, the improvements that are actually under construction right now. Um, but we've really looked at this area as three different opportunities because not this stretch of waterfront is not consistent um, the whole way and has different constraints. Um, so we've, we're showing them with the three different boxes, the three different areas that we're going to talk about. So this is an overall plan of um, what we're showing, which looks quite small. Um, and we're gonna zoom in a little bit, but just to, to let folks know that um, what we're proposing and the preferred plan that we are going to talk more about is a levee or a berm um, at the water side of Palmer Cove Park that provides park amenities that we'll discuss. We have then a seawall with an elevated walkway along this portion of the waterfront. Um, this is being the most constrained areas because we do have close buildings here um, at Pioneer Terrace. And then the third section being what is currently a small green space right on the water um, that we've sort of called the Leech Street end of our project and showing here, again, an elevated walkway along the scene wall with a little bit of a gathering zone. So we'll go through those each individually. Thank you. Yeah. So the existing uh, park at Palmer Cove Park has a relatively recent construction of a waterfront promenade that's concrete with some amenities like picnic tables, um, and benches, uh, and this is all right at the level of the top of the seawall at what we're calling elevation eight or eight and a half. Yeah, so down. Yeah. So this is just a modeling of what the park looks like currently with the grass and the terraces and the sea level all being at the same height. Go ahead. Left on unchanged. Uh, we have seen this winter along with we will see going into the future, the breaching of the low seawall and, and the stormwater and ocean water going into the park. The preferred plan that, as Neil said, we will be wrapping up at the end of June to get permit ready consists of a berm that will elevate the land up to eight feet at the top. So this white box that's being shown is a gathering terrace up at elevation 16. And what we're providing for and showing here in gray are accessible walkways. So very um, reasonably pitched walkways, sloped walkways that get you up to the top of this levee or embankment and then also then provide the opportunity in, a, in a, um, an accessible walkway to get down to the waterfront. What this option does is it leaves all the current amenities in place. The waterfront terrace is still at the waterfront. You still have the ability to put kayaks and boats and to get into the water. So it does not change the height of the seawall at the edge at all. And the ground that's elevated is what, what protects the park. So this is what that model would look like. We have, again, the terraces at the waterfront in a storm condition or a severe high tide could be temporarily inundated with water. As the water recedes, these would still be occupiable. But what the berm does is it keeps that water from going into the park and into the neighborhood. 
So again, we'll go to the second, the red, uh, maybe we're going to the blue box blue. next. Okay, the blue box. The blue box. Yeah. So the Leach Street, the other end. Um, so currently the situation of the existing um, seawall again is low at elevation eight and a half. There is a walkway, a sidewalk um, that goes right along the edge of the water with then grass in, inland from that. Our proposal, uh, because the seawall itself at the edge, um, the current edge, would be elevated, we are also elevating a walk along its edge so that people can still have a relationship of being able to completely see over and walk along the length of, of the seawall. Walking along the length of the seawall was actually the number one um, desire of the canvassing and the, the surveying that we did of neighbors. Um, it was something that was considered very important. So this scheme does allow for people to continue to have that relationship with the water's edge. So what happens here is that as the seawall gets raised, we're also widening a walkway along it. So the seawall essentially is a very large seawall that would allow us to then also be able to use that as a public amenity. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so we wanted to do this kind of quick modeling again. So this is today in a normal low tide or mid tide and at storm surge, um, it would be flooded. But what our proposal does is by raising the seawall and providing for the walkway and then an expansion where that ground gets a little wider, we can have a little bit of a gathering spot at the top. So just again, some modeling to see what this looks like. So today um, and then next, this is what uh, it would look like. We are building up to elevation 13. So at, at in this rendering, we're showing a five foot elevation change. Wow, so this, I should talk about this part. Do you wanna talk about that part? Yeah. Okay. So um, one, aspect of this project um, that we haven't talked about as much in past meetings is um, the area at the end of this of this wall at Leach Street, um, right where this arrow is. Um, if we build this wall as shown here, um, there could still be flooding um, that would inundate the neighborhood from the south in the direction that you see that yellow arrow. And so it's necessary to do something um, coming off of that wall, bringing it in landward um, to protect um, everything else that's being protected by um, the, by the seawall um, and to have that wall meet at an elevation of the grade of the land such that um, you wouldn't have the flooding um, that you actually that you see here. So putting in that wall in this in this um, image, then the flooding that you're seeing on this map wouldn't be occurring. Um, we have some uh, preliminary um, drawings of what this would look like uh, more conceptually. Um, these are not engineering drawings. These were done by uh, Nasser from Woods Hole Group uh, just to give people a sense of what this would look like and how it would work. So you can see on the top the existing conditions. Um, you've got the the water on the left hand side of the screen. Um, and this is just showing this is um, Lafayette Place and where it turns into Leach Street. These are existing fences in the back of the homes that are on Leach Street. And this is um, further along the fence um, up towards the grade that we would need to have the wall meet and be built into. This is showing you what it would look like when there isn't any flooding, um, this middle um, sketch here, where we would have the wall that Naomi just described, there would be a wall be that would be built out off of the seawall. The street would be open and available for vehicular and pedestrian access. And then on the other side on city property, there would be um, a approximately four foot flood wall that would go along the city property until it met um, with the grade of the land that was there. So 
what would happen during a flooding event is that there would be a deployable structure that would come across um, the street that would connect to those two uh, permanent uh, pieces of the wall. And that would protect uh, the area and not, according to the Woods Hole Group uh, modeling, would not cause any um, would not worsen the impacts of the flooding on the other side of that wall. Um, so if you're if you're not on the Palmer Cove Park side of this this piece that's being built, it wouldn't be any worse than it would have been otherwise. And in some ways, um, and now I'm speaking somewhat for Nasser, <laughs> in some ways it could help because it would reduce the velocity of the water that would be coming in um, from the south. So these images um, were ones that Woods Hole Group provided that are um, an example of a, this type of deployable structure. Um, I believe it's in Austria um, along a river, um, but it shows you, it gives you a sense of how this would happen. This is uh, clearly a much bigger structure than what we'd be talking about. Um, one thing that's interesting about this picture on the left that Naomi pointed out when we were looking at these is that if you look at this berm right here, um, you can see that the, there's a wall that's being, that's built into it. And then that connects to this deployable structure. So, um, this is also a nice picture to illustrate what would be happening in the Palmer Cove park area where the berm that we're proposing would be connecting to the seawall, uh, that Naomi just described. So we'll we'll finish up this presentation and just talk about the third zone, the area shown in red. This is the area again that is the tightest area um, because we have uh, buildings owned by the Salem Housing Authority uh, at Pioneer Terrace, um, very close to the the current sea um, an ocean ocean edge. Um, we have two different different spots here, but the most constrained is the area that is on the right hand side of the plan where we have uh, vehicular access and road that goes around um, the what they call building 13 at Pioneer Terrace. Uh, this is something that we have to maintain access on. So the constraint really came from being able to get emergency vehicles still to be able to circulate and, and provide their services to this part portion of the neighborhood. So that really set up our width and how wide we could have our, um, our seawall be and the occupiable walkway. Go ahead. So it's a small change, and maybe if you were looking away from the screen, you could have you could have missed it. But currently, right now, the the driving lanes go almost all the way over the seawall. There's a small barrier, um, and what we are proposing is again widening a seawall and having an elevated walkway, such that we can still circulate all the way from Leach Street across this entire portion of the seawall and then connect to the top of the levee at, at Palmer Cove Park. So it, this is the important piece of the project because it does actually um, provide that continuous access that we heard being so important to the neighborhood. So what that looks like today, again, we'd have um, driving lanes right up next to the curb of the seawall and buildings on the left-hand side. Um, what we're proposing is taking the access down to the one lane. Um, so it would be a one way around the building. This um, was something we worked on with the fire chief and other folks within the city to understand there would be that kind of vehicular change but we can get the service vehicles in and around um, and provide a quite uh, a sizable walkway. Um, we wanted to show this um, last time we had a meeting 
uh, we actually talked about this as being the walkway that we thought we could provide. We, after being um, really challenged uh, by the community and by folks um, in the municipality to really look harder as to see whether or not we could make the walkway wider. We've done that through both um, moving the walkway a little further out over the existing revetment and by making sure that we aren't, are, that we're providing the minimum, but not over providing for that one lane of travel. Is there anything on that that you wanna? Um, the only, the only thing I'll add in terms of the the road going from two way to one way is is um, just so people understand that that is actually a plan that's in place uh, now. Um, whether this project or when this not dependent on this project or or when it occurs, so that's something that will probably be happening uh, sooner than any of these changes happen. So um, the one way change is is. In, is being planned as we speak. Many people park there and sit and watch the water for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and fish. And so will there be parking? If it's a one way from Leach to Lafayette place, there's not gonna be any place for them to park. No, yeah, so I'll, I'll just repeat the question because so people that may need to hear it on Zoom, but the question was, will there be parking in this area um, because there is parking there now. And so uh, the, the answer to that question is no. Um, the, I, will, I will mention that, um, so the area that we're talking about here where the street is, some people do park in front of what is building 13. Um, in addition to that road, plans for that road being uh, one way, um, there are plans now for that parking to be prohibited. So um, that parking will also be going away. Uh, that, and that's not dependent in that section. And that's not dependent on this project. Right. The other parking in the neighborhood, the, this project is not forcing any change to the parking. That's not to say that it won't change. It won't change over time, but it is just these spaces in front of building 13 that this project would necessitate them going away. Um, so it's not a, a ton of parking. I will say that um, as far as the ability to fish and be able to sit and look at the water, this elevated walkway, while tight in this one location, we're actually providing a lot more space down on the Leach Street side and then also um, at still at the park. Okay, so it's it appears to be a one way now. Um, so I'm thinking the Leach Street to you know the Lafayette place from Leach Street um, is being tightened as well, but it doesn't look like we're just referring to this one space. Yeah, it's just this one space really that changes that gets that would have to narrow down in order to accommodate the walkway. Um, this is this is a technical drawing of the proposed seawall. Um, you know, this is part of what we got into to make sure that we could make this wider. Um, and what we are um, show this drawing is actually showing a couple things. So we talked about an almost five foot tall uh, wall for the near term. So this where my cursor's being shown would be where this wall would be built up to in this first phase of the project. It, it means that there's about about four foot nine or, or five feet, depending on what elevation the, the different part of the neighborhood is at, exposed wall. Um, and that's what we've been modeling in these in these uh, in these diagrams. What we're doing is we have moved, this is the, this portion here is the, oh, sorry, keep advancing <laughs> it. This portion is the concrete seawall that would take on the, the force of the waves and the storm. There is a recurve that um, helps to redirect the wave action. So this curve is important um, in protection uh, and then you'll see here that what we are providing for is a walkway up at the very at that very top level. So again, on these plans, the top of the seawall 
and where people would walk is at the same level. As we move into the future, and if the modeling is correct that we're seeing for 2050 or 2070, this wall will start to be compromised in likely storms. So within the engineering of this wall, we have built in the ability to be able to increase the size of the wall, which is being shown here in this section. Um, at that time, our proposal is to actually leave the walkway at the elevation that it's at. So the only part of the wall that gets higher is the part that's out on the ocean side. So if I go back to this drawing, in the future what will happen is that instead of a, an open railing, we will have a seawall that is in this location. So at what you see from the neighborhood is going to be in this plane here will still be that about five foot tall wall with railings. Um, and then you will see the extended seawall beyond. This is a clever way to have an investment in the, in the short term that still provides us all the access and then gives us the opportunity to be able to build on it incrementally as sea level may or may not rise to, to certain levels. I don't know if there's anything else to add on that. How'd I do? <laughs> I'm looking at our engineers. <laughs> Right. Yes. Yeah, so, so at that time when we do have to build in that extra extra height of the seawall, what we're showing right now at a twelve foot six foot wide walkway would narrow down to a nine foot uh, walkway. Okay. So I I think I talked about this um, when we opened the meeting, but so the next steps for us, as I mentioned, is this this grant. Um, ends at the end of June. Um, our goal is to have 75% uh, design documents, really like a sort of a grant ready package um, where we can go towards the next step of advancing this project. Um, we are um, currently and will continue to pursue uh, funding opportunities, um, state and federal funding opportunities to help pay for this project. Uh, the city um, is committed to, to doing this project, but we also um, believe that there are, uh, the good news is that there are funding opportunities out there for us. And um, we think that we um, will will need some of that assistance. So we'll be pursuing those um, and hopefully uh, be able to move this forward within the coming years. Um, and then with that, uh, are there any other questions um, about any part of the project or the timeline or anything else? Yeah. Just the, uh, what will the section behind the Lake Street properties look like? Um, because there's some, I mean, I know it's city property behind the wall, but is it, right. is it a berm, is it concrete, is it? So, the tie back here. yeah, this, so this area, like this four foot wall, yeah. So, it, this would be a wall. Um, what, like, what the facing of that wall would look like has not been determined. That must just be a concrete wall, like you're saying. Um, I think that's, that's the that section that's behind at least two houses, maybe three. Yeah, three, the three houses. I think yours is the second one up, so the, then the next one. Um, up the street is is the, where it would end. Um, the The plan for the face of the wall in front of Pioneer Terrace, and this could certainly be talked about. This is a detail that we would need to come back to the community. This, these are some of the smaller details that likely wouldn't be part of what we finish on here. Um, is that the facing would have some sort of um, form to it. So there could be, it would ne not necessarily just be a flat um, concrete face. Uh, there are interesting ways to do it. We don't have any of those images. We had some at our previous meetings, but um, so it, it hopefully will be a little bit more interesting than just a, a concrete wall. So will Lee Street need to go one way? I was trying to think of a traffic flow with that off the other place being one way. So the question was, will Leach Street need to be one way? And the answer is no. No, the, this, the width of Leach Street is not changing at all. So currently the 
you know, the existing is the same footprint. There's your grass and then you have your sidewalk. This still is a grass area and a sidewalk, except it's being raised. So where, if this is going to elevation 13 from elevation eight, we have this being bermed up so that you see less of the wall from the neighborhood. So it will look like a mound and then, and then the top of the, the walkway. So we, were a lot, we can use that extra space that we have, but we're not pulling into the road in any way. So the vehicular circulation should be exactly the same as normal. It's better to go back to... Do we need to see whether or not there's any chats? I think when Christian's been monitoring. Okay. Um, are there any questions, Christian, are there any questions on Zoom? Okay. Um, any other questions here? All right, I'll just, um, let me just. Neil? Yeah, I can clarify a little bit. The area behind, behind your terrace that loops around, that was conveyed two years ago. The city council conveyed it to Pioneer Terrace of the city property. And Pioneer Terrace had secured funding about a half a million dollars to re landscape or whatever. And it had to be in their name. And they're actually taking a little stretch that Naomi was talking about. And I think the intent is not to have any parking there. That's right. I can talk a little bit more about that. Sorry. Uh, we were only talking about this section here at elevation 13. Right now, this essentially looks like a driveway in front of these two houses. So that's actually being landscaped into a pedestrian area. And if you can see, it's pretty small, but there's a dotted dashed line right here. This is actually a mountable curb, meaning that you can pull a vehicle up into this area, but they are um, eliminating permanent parking in front of these buildings. Um, and this area is for, again, emergency vehicles to be able to pull up to access um, to get to these buildings. But the rest of this is becoming almost an, like an extension of the seawalk, the, the, sorry, the, the walkway along the waterfront that is at, at Palmer Cove Park. Um, part of the, you actually, you can see sort of here in this rendering that there are cars parked underneath here. These cars are particularly vulnerable um, in storms and, uh, and other events. And so Pioneer Terrace is also planning on removing the parking from here as well. So there's, you know, a handful of parking spaces here and a handful of parking spaces here that are going away. So important to just emphasize that what Naomi just described is separate from the project that we're talking about and is something that is in the works and more certain to be happening soon. Um, everything that we've talked about is hopefully to be happening soon. <laughs> Lucy. Has Lucy, yeah. Is that preparing, um, kind of prepping the area before the actual project? So is that going to happen first in terms of kind of taking the parking spaces away and creating that little lift? Yeah, this, so the question was whether or not that, that uh, changing the area in front of Palmer, uh, in front of Pioneer Terrace's buildings is preparing for this project. Um, the, they are separate projects and Pioneer Terrace secured funding to create this waterfront walkway independent um, from this project. Uh, and it's actually something that's going to start construction this spring. Um, and so moving out those parking, those parking spaces is something that is a completely separate um, project. As far as the removing the parking in front of the, of the, their community or their building 13, um, that's also sort of an independent project. More than anything, it just really makes a lot of sense for um, the neighborhood because, again, this area we've seen this winter flood several times. Um, 
so as far as the the community and and Salem Housing Authority is concerned, those really aren't viable parking spaces anymore because of the, the how vulnerable they are to flood. Are there any other questions? Okay, just for the sake of everybody in Zoom land or if people watch a recording of this, this is um, our project website. And if anyone has any other questions about this project, they can reach out to me, Neil Duffy, or Christian Team. Um, and the QR code is there to bring you to the project site as well. And we will have a recording of this presentation um, and these materials on that project site as soon as we can. And with that, thank you everybody for coming. Have a good night.